Thank you for that. That was, that was wonderful. Well, we are in uh, the midst of our most comprehensive introduction to discipleship uh, that we've done in any sermon series, although it's still just an introduction. Jesus defined the goal of discipleship as reaching more and more people who find new life in him, eternal life, uh, not, not new life in name only, but learning to obey, learning to rebuild their lives around everything he taught, rebuilding their whole lives around everything that he taught. Uh, the first step in any rebuilding process is to become familiar with some basic tools. We've chosen five. There are a number of tools. We've chosen five. And today we finish a brief introduction to the subject of worship. And we've done that by uh, a little differently than we often do. We, we're looking at one passage of Scripture, Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. We've been looking at that in four different ways. Um, and uh, today we come to the last two verses of that. Let me read it. The whole, let me read the whole thing to you. <clears throat> Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Seven verses. In seven verses we get this marvelous overview of worship that reaches its apex by talking about uh, fellowship because the tools kind of overlap. In verses 19 and 20, we showed how real worship, the worship of the living God as opposed to idols, begins with Jesus Christ. He passed through the curtain, the temple curtain, into God's own presence uh, in an act that's symbolized by the high priest in the temple. Jesus covered the Ten Commandments with his blood, satisfying the demands of righteousness and uh, that sin be judged. But he offered his own blood. So the demands of the righteous judgment fell on him personally and need never fall on anyone he represents. And then we saw in verses 21 and 22 how uh, by faith we can draw near to the living God, taking advantage of the welcome that Christ created. We can have what we call a religious experience of God's very presence, and we're having that right now. Uh, coming together in faith and reconsecrating ourselves to him, we experience the wonder of drawing near. Whether it's just a small congregation with a single guitar or a large congregation with an orchestra, God inhabits our praise. The Holy Spirit ministers the word. Jesus meets us at his table. He's doing that all, all over the world. And then verse 23 declares that the raw experience of God's presence is just the beginning because God's promises chart an ever-expanding, limitless roadway throughout life that could carry the experience of God outside of religious worship until our entire lives become worship. That's what Paul said we, we saw, that spiritual worship involves how we actually live our whole lives to God's glory and in his presence. And that would mean living all of our lives consciously with him, following Christ wherever we go, taking the spirit of God and taking the kingdom of God with us. But promises are just that. They aren't experience. Just promises that we could follow Christ and we could take the kingdom of God with us. So this summary of worship is not yet complete. It needs one more thing. It needs the personal encouragement of God's people to one another. And if you take this one verse out of context, it sounds like a plea for Christians just to go to church on Sunday or maybe a plea for the preacher to make his sermons more motivational. But it's, it's more than that. This was the early church's secret ingredient. The aspect of worship that enabled the early church to follow Christ and to carry the kingdom of God everywhere with hardly any staff 
virtually no programs or property, Christianity swept through the provinces of the Roman Empire. And the secret ingredient was not entertaining worship or flashy events. It wasn't children's programs or evangelistic programs. None of those things existed. In addition to what has already been said in this text, the secret ingredient that skyrocketed Christian faith across the empire was the way that rank and file Christians, not the leaders, but everyone with faith, stimulated each other to follow Christ. It was just a few centuries later, after Christ, that the church largely traded away this power. Almost forgot that the text was in the Bible. Christians decided they wanted to recreate an Old Testament style priesthood. And then they traded meeting in homes for building ever greater buildings reminiscent of Old Testament temples. And the church went backwards, focusing almost entirely on the initial religious aspect of worship. And they would come and experience that and then they would go home. They stopped encouraging each other to live out this stuff. The passion of knowing Christ cooled off. And to some extent, Christianity was truncated from a movement into a religion only. The Protestant Reformation corrected some of this because we rediscovered the core of the gospel is sovereign grace experienced through faith. And that brought the church's liturgy more in line with the scriptures. And by getting back into the original scriptures, which was a hallmark of the Reformation, church members discovered a wealth of promises that God has given to us. And that took everything one step further. But the full power of life-encompassing worship has only been experienced in flashes. Flashes that we tend to call revivals. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of revival that you schedule for a weekend. You know, when you turn up the juice on preaching and music and you ratchet up the religious experience, and then all the momentum blows over a week later having produced no change. I'm talking about the great awakenings of history that create a whole generation of Christians who bring the Spirit of God and the Kingdom of God out of worship services into their lives, into their world, into their homes, into their careers, initiating whole social movements and great missions efforts. In seminary, I studied under a man who spent his life analyzing revivals that had left a long-term impact. And I learned that one key ingredient of all of them was this final aspect of worship that we see in today's text. And it has to do with Christians, all Christians, stimulating each other to live out the faith. You'll notice the term one another. It's used twice here. It's a very important phrase, of course, in the New Testament. This is not about uh, Christians being led in liturgy like you're being led now. This is what happens after that. This is about Christians having been led in liturgy, having been drawn near to God, having discovered afresh the promises of God, then going on to stimulating each other to grasp those promises, to create love and good works in the world. The early church experienced their liturgy in ways that we would recognize. They read scripture, they prayed, they had teaching, they had singing, but they experienced the Lord's Supper differently. Each week, they would share an actual meal. Everyone brought something. They called it a love feast. It was a joyful time for the whole church family. I mean, the whole church. I mean, it's meeting in a house, like 30 people, okay? But it was more than just a potluck because after the meal, they celebrated the symbolic meal with Jesus, the Lord's Supper. So eating together beforehand served as preparation for the holiest part of their time together. It wasn't only a time of socializing. It was a time for all the participants to encourage each other in the faith they had just been praying and hearing about. 
Paul talks about this kind of interaction in the New Testament. You just don't realize what he's talking about. For example, to look carefully how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, to make the best use of your time. The days are evil. Don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Determining all that stuff, those verses are the context for what comes next. And this is an atmosphere of a worship experience, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and so on. People just didn't walk around all day smiling and quoting random verses to each other as they walked down the street. This was part of their worship time, uh, dedicated to stimulating each other to make the most of their opportunities and to accomplish God's revealed will in the stuff of life. Our text tells us that this mutual encouragement was not an afterthought. It's something serious. It's something intentional. I, I got that again this week. I don't know if I ever knew this before. I was looking at the text, and I, looked, I said, what does that mean? What does that word stir up? And I found out that it was the Greek word paroxysmos. I don't usually bring up the Greek stuff here, but this one I think is important. This one uh, reminded me of an English word, paroxysm. A paroxysm is a sudden spasm of emotion or, or activity. The Greek word is to provoke, and it's not a gentle word. When Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement, this is the word for sharp. If you were going to incite a riot, this would be the Greek word for incite. Now, the author is not implying that we should anger each other or stir up anger. That's not the point. He explains what he's talking about in normal language in the next verse. It's to encourage. That's all he's talking about. But he colors this encouragement with a word for incite, I think, to shock the reader, to emphasize how important this is. It's almost like kind of shaking you, you know? Not that it should be harsh, because what we're provoking is love. But the world has this mild slap of reality to it. We need to be serious about actually living out our faith. You get generic encouragement from your pastor in a sermon. I do my best to dig out the meaning of a text. And I try to intelligently and passionately plead with us all to put the truth into practice. But a word from a brother or a sister, or as we saw earlier, from a child, a word, direct, uh, tailored just for you, given to you, face-to-face -face as a gift, that's ten times, that's a hundred times more effective than the generic application that is suggested by a preacher. The Bible says the truth is like clothing that you put on. What you wear says something about who you are. The early church saw slaves worshiping with slave owners, saw employees worshiping with employers, saw military of all rank worshiping together. And they, as they discovered the truth, they helped each other try it on. The slave owner could help a slave try on royal robes that befit a child of the king. That looks good on you. The slave owner could try on the simple robes of a servant that reflect the beautiful soul of our Savior. And the slave could say, you know, when you do that, you remind me of Jesus. There are so many outfits in the scriptures. Work boots and crowns and prophets' mantles and priests' breastplates and spiritual weapons for battle. And they all just lay there displayed out as we study them. We need to encourage one another to try them on. Pick up the shield of faith. Pick up the pen of a prophet and ask a brother or sister, how does this look? Get a, get a positive, encouraging response. You know, when you prayed, it was, like, it was like incense raising. I could almost see God smiling. You know, when you picked up the sword of of truth, man, it looked good in your hand. Those kinds of encouragements can change a life. Last Sunday, I preached on the promises of God. Remember that? Well, you might not. <laughs> Nobody remembers much in most of what a preacher says, and that's okay. 
But what's not okay is to forget what you heard God saying to you. If all you hear is the preacher talking and not the word of God, then you aren't listening with ears that hear. And I remember, I, you might remember, I urged us to come to the table with a promise of God that was special to us. You remember that? Remember the promise you, you chose then? This is the one I chose. Uh, this is one of my old favorites, New American Standard Version. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't really grabbed this uh, for years, but I wrote this down because it's an old favorite, and I wrote it down in my workbook. And that night, I spent 15, 20 minutes with my action group, a couple of friends with whom, you know, we share what we write. We meet via video. We talked about what's going on generally, but we also shared what we wrote. And so I shared this verse because that's what I wrote down. Then I also wrote down what I thought it was saying to me. And, and uh, uh, what, what I heard it saying to me was, God wants to create partnerships, and I can be his partner if I really want to. That's what I wrote down. In discussion, I had the courage to try this truth on. I hadn't worn it for a while, and so I picked it up, and I talked about it. What would it be like if I wore this? And, and I said, just because just I was talking to them and sharing it, I said, you know, I think I'm going to ask God to show me this week where my heart is compromised in terms of being completely his. I didn't wake up Sunday morning intending to do that. But while sharing with my brothers, that's what I said. And I asked them to pray for me. I believe they did. Last week was a much long needed turning point for me. How God did it's a longer story I'm not going to burden you with. But God showed me one area where my heart has been compromised. I had let myself become frankly depressed over my injury and over my chronic pain. And I had lost any hope and any anticipation of a vibrant life ever again. Just pain, just limited nobility, poor me, just feeling sorry for myself. And God showed me that that was compromising my heart and compromising my service and my faith in him now. It compromised my devotion to him and my faith in him. And I could do something about that. And if I did, he would fulfill his promise to strongly support me. Last week, I started exercising again in earnest. It's a bit painful, but not really more painful than if I didn't. I don't know how much function I'll get back. But I do know that my back and leg pain is no longer going to put me on a shelf. And it never will. That could only be true if I let it be true. And I'm not going to let it be true. God may want to do a miracle. That's fine with me. And I may, I'd be happy if he provides more surgery. But I know one thing that God wants. He wants to strengthen me so we can be partners. And right now, I would rather have that than a miracle. Because more than anything else, I want to be his partner. So I'm going to keep walking, and I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to walk better. I'm going to do what my physical therapist tells me to do all the time. Be strong and courageous. My attitude was transformed. Go ahead, plug. Go ahead, that's fine. Go ahead, that's fine. Right. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. I almost didn't talk about that, but I did because I need encouragement. Uh, how did that happen? Did it happen through my sermon? No. <laughs> I preached it, it happened through my sermon. Uh, did it happen because I wrote down what I heard? Almost, but not quite. Things changed when I tried on the truth with my brothers, and they listened, and they responded positively, and they committed to pray for me, and they encouraged me. I cannot explain to you exactly why it's true, but we need each other's personal encouragement to grasp God's promises. We need it all the time. We need it every week. Guys, I look forward to talking to you tonight. I can't wait for next week. This is going to be great. Will my new attitude stick? Well, I think it will if the encouragement continues. When people would come up to me, uh, I would say, Glenn, I know that you are working with God on getting stronger. I know he loves you. I know he's going to be faithful to help you. Don't you worry if it goes slow. Don't you worry if you have a setback. You're going to get there. You are God's partner. You just lean on your Lord, and he'll give you everything you need. I need to hear that. I need to hear that often. What do you need to hear? 
That is what many in the early church did every week. And without even trying, they turned the world upside down because they took the Spirit of God, they took the kingdom of God out from the worship service to experience his promises in the wide world. Okay, we aren't the early church, and even they had to work at this. Text says, you better, you know, some people aren't even meeting together, so it's always been a problem. But when Christians leave out this last part of corporate worship, whether it be then or now, we tend to leave our faith at the door of the church when we leave. The preaching, the singing, the prayer, the sacraments, they're all designed by God to lift our spirits, to teach us his great and precious promises. But studying the promises of God with suggested applications is not the same thing as me owning what God is saying to me, owning it by sharing it and asking for support. Most of the time, that's the only way I am going to actually leave this building and go out of my way to help somebody who needs help, somebody who can't pay me back. That's the only way I'm going to go out here and forgive somebody who has really hurt me and forgive from the heart. That's how I'm going to go out and heal a relationship at work through clear, humble confession. That's the way I would go out and contribute something positive to a social quandary. That's the way I will go out and I will actually share the gospel message. That's when I will go out and, and work harder at weaning off alcohol and painkillers or help a new believer become part of the family. Stirring up one another is a crucial component to turning life into worship. Now, your session has, has looked at this uh, passage we've been studying, consider how. We've been considering, how do you do this? What have we come up with? Just a few things, and it's for starters. The workbook for adults and workbooks for kids. You know, children can be spiritual too. Jesus told us to imitate them. They can exercise simple faith. We teach them at home. We teach them in Sunday school. Why can't they listen in church for what God has to say to them? Use the workbook to write down things that prick the mind over the course of the worship service. Focus on one thing that God is saying. And it's not usually a voice that comes out of nowhere. It's some promise that is stated or implied in the Word of God that tells you who God is and what He wants. And if it's true, it's true for you. Write it down. Share it with somebody. And then starting today, we have a number of opportunities to help us warm up to this kind of thing. I'm going to show this slide at the end of every service from now on. I'll run through it just once. Because what's, what's happening today is not the end. It's just the beginning. Uh, we, we have opportunities that run the gamut of dynamics coming up very, very soon now, today, from the uh, Connections uh, group. And that's going to be in the parlor. You can't share with people you don't know. So Connections isn't about sharing deep things at all. It's about getting to know people. It's great for newcomers. Hey, it's great for anybody. I mean, you, you learn a little bit about SBEP. You get to know some folks. What's not to like? If you would like a partner for an action group, but you don't know anybody, that's a good place to start. Or add that to a sermon discussion right here in the sanctuary, where the only people who share personal thoughts are those who want to. The group's probably going to be too large for everybody to share anyway, so there's no pressure. But you can still think about what you hear and try on some different ideas. Two adult education classes. Those are going to be in the narthex rooms to both sides. Study of apologetics. How to explain and defend uh, the, the word of God in, in this day and age. Right over there. Real talk. Over there. Uh, where you're going to learn how to have a conversation with somebody that includes Jesus. Uh, I've, been, I've had that uh, uh, instruction also. It's fantastic. Um, if I know my, uh, Mark, he's going to have you in role play, and you're going to have fun. Um, to a men's Bible study. You know what a Bible study is. That will be down in the auditorium. Women's Bible study will ca come back in the fall. To growth groups, growth groups where you can meet with a group that's committed to stick together, to study the Word and look for personal application, stick with you for a quarter, maybe longer, where you can encourage each other and pray for each other. There will be four of those in the trailer, and we have some in the auditorium as well, right? 
Mutual encouragement turns liturgical worship into a life of worship. For this to work, a lot of us have to be involved. A lot of us have to come on Sunday realizing we need others to stimulate us. A lot of us have to come on Sunday realizing I am needed here to stimulate somebody else. As you come to the table, ask your Lord to free up your faith in Him, your confidence, your enthusiasm, your desire to shine with His light for the whole world to see. Free it by taking a page from those first Christians and stir up in each other life choices that turn our whole lives into worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us in your word. You did. We come to your son's table now. We're telling you what we heard. We're going to tell you that. Please help us encourage each other to live what we learn. Help us to be faithful to do that every week from now on. We pray that your son will return soon. The day will come soon and find us thus engaged. We pray in his name. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a time of intimate shared fellowship with Jesus and his people. You are welcome to participate if you've confessed Christ in any Christian church and you desire to follow him today. Now, if that's not where you're at, I urge you to take this time, just where you're seated, and, and ask the Lord to make himself known to you. You may find that little card called the story helpful in that regard. What we're going to do is we're going to come down front to receive the elements, come down the center aisle, and today, starting today, come down, you can come down the uh, outside aisles by the windows, okay, either one. Uh, choose whichever path is convenient for you or maybe less crowded. Some people like to take the elements standing or kneeling. That's easiest done here up front. You can do that before you return to your seat. And then everybody returns to their seat via the middle aisles. Okay? I have confidence you can figure it out. (laughs) If standing is challenging, ask a neighbor to flag the elder in the back, and he will come and serve you. And while we come down together, we, we take the elements individually whenever we like while we're singing, first the bread and then the cup. I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that our Lord, Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. He said, this is my body. It's my body. And it's broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Because we're told as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. So once again, in his name, I invite you to his table.